Hey, it's Aaron. Welcome to my show, Reeducation. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about military strategy, specifically ancient military strategy. And in this case, we're going to be talking about defense. If you haven't seen the uh, video before this entitled Roman Military Tactics, please check that out in the uh, card up above and also the link below. And with all that being said, let's get started. Okay, so if you need a recap, a phalanx is basically a skirmish line of people, maybe layered several deep, uh, all holding shields, protecting themselves in a tight formation. Uh, often these people will have some sort of melee weapon like a sword, a gladius, or even maybe a Roman pilum, which is very similar to a spear, more like a javelin. Uh, or they could also have other things as well, such as more modern weapons, uh, like a 42-inch long baton or uh, other things like that. The basic idea is that you and all of your compatriots are standing shoulder to shoulder, usually armed with defensive, large uh, body size shields, and you are able to form a strong defensive line that you could use for many different reasons, possibly say to push a large crowd or to defend against a large military force that's coming at you. Uh, any one of those things is basically what the whole purpose of a phalanx is. And like I said in my other video, there are lots of different ways to defeat a phalanx. It turns out that a phalanx, even though it seems like it's almost impenetrable, it actually isn't. It's actually one of the weaker formations if you use military strategy, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. Okay, so another fantastic way to defeat a phalanx, of course, is difficult ground. This is something that Sun Tzu talks a lot about, uh, and it usually encompasses things like mountain forests, rugged steeps, marshes, uh, or a lot of obstacles in the way. Uh, if there's very difficult ground, if there's a lot of um, treacherous terrain, it really breaks up the formations of any one of those phalanx because phalanx have an incredibly hard time uh, actually maneuvering through any sort of obstacle or difficult ground. That's basically the biggest problem with any military formation. They're very slow, they're unable to respond quickly to certain threats, and they have a very hard time maneuvering. Even turning around when you're trying to walk in a double column formation is a daunting task. And that's where difficult ground comes into play. If there are a lot of obstacles on the ground, it makes it extremely difficult for a phalanx to actually hold position and continue to move through that area. And as soon as that defensive line is broken apart, it makes it extremely weak. It sections individuals off, it makes them completely vulnerable, and individual legionnaires or individual soldiers in general usually don't have that good of a time when they're surrounded by a massive mob of people. So if a phalanx is forced to move up a hill and there are barbarians at the top of that hill, they will have the advantage. If a phalanx is forced to move through an obstacle course breaking them apart, then the barbarians will have an advantage. If the phalanx breaks at all for any reason, then the barbarians have an advantage. But say the goal isn't to defeat a phalanx. Say the goal is maybe to defeat, I don't know, a sentry or something maybe smaller like a cohort or even a platoon, that sort of thing. Then a different strategy would obviously need to be implemented, and there are a lot of different strategies that can be used against that sort of group. The very first thing that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about defending against that sort of group is usually elastic defense, or in other words, defense in depth which uh, basically is a military strategy where you set up a simple line at the front of what would seem to be uh, your uh, battlefield, right? And you oppose the enemy directly at that front line, but instead of trying to hold that position, you constantly and tactically fall back. You constantly move back positions, giving up territory, giving up space to the opposing force. Now, the opposing force is going to feel as though this is amazing. They're finally being able to attack and being able to gain ground and take advantage of the entire situation. But what they don't realize is the entire time that's happening they're being worn down. They're being whittled away and exhausted through that entire corridor that they're being funneled through. Because yes, they might be fighting those individuals on that front line, but they're also being attacked by other individuals or obstacles or whatever it is from all sides, possibly from behind, and they're constantly having their lines broken and their morale depleted. Even though they're gaining territory, they're exhausting themselves and all of their resources until eventually you make it back to the actual line, the place where you're actually going to make a real stand. 
And usually once you get to that point, you'll have a lot of different people, reserve troops and that sort of thing, basically lying in wait, preparing themselves to take the slack back away from the people that have been fighting this entire time uh, and allow them to finally regroup pull behind the line, and then they're replaced by another group of individuals who are ready, energized, and willing to fight. And obviously, that leads to that cohort or that group, whoever's going through that corridor, um, to be completely demoralized, to be completely exhausted, and uh, to be completely unable to actually finish the battle by the time they get through to the end of that corridor. It works best if it's happening in a corridor, so that way uh, there's no way to get out on either side, but it could also happen in an open field. It can happen in a lot of different types of terrain, but typically the best way to set up elastic defenses uh, is through a long corridor. Next is the Fabian strategy, or basically ancient guerrilla tactics. Uh, the Fabian strategy is basically an approach where you don't actually directly attack the enemy forces because that would be suicide, and you kind of hit them on the edges, on the outskirts, taking out individuals in the back, taking out individuals on the sides, and making sure that no matter what you do, you aren't actually engaging the enemy head on, but you're always using indirect tactics to basically whittle them away and deplete their resources. And this is actually a military strategy that was able to defeat many, many Roman legions uh, in Hispania way, way back in ancient, ancient history. Essentially, the idea is to use indirect guerrilla warfare tactics to constantly beat down and wear out the uh, enemy without ever actually engaging them in a pitched battle, in an actual set-piece battle on a big open area. You always make sure that it happens indirectly so you lose the least amount of your own troops and they lose the most amount of theirs. And of course, talking about the Fabian strategy, I would be remiss to not include uh, attrition warfare because attrition warfare is probably one of the most uh, ancient tactics and maybe one of the most brutal. Attrition tactics basically work off of the idea that a military fights on its stomach. So if you're able to destroy that, if you're able to destroy their reserves, stop any of their supply lines from being able to bring them food or water, uh, if you're able to burn all of their fields or destroy all of their water bottles and uh, jugs of milk or whatever it is, then you're basically going to be able to starve those individuals out and make it impossible for them to even think of fighting. Like I was saying, a military fights on its stomach. So yeah, it's one of the most ugly, disgusting types of warfare there is. Attacking somebody indirectly by destroying their food resources and starving those people. Uh, but it's an old, ancient strategy, and it was actually used very much in siege warfare uh, all through Roman history and through the Middle Ages and all of those sorts. And it's actually even used a lot today. Now, there aren't just ways of defending yourself on the battlefield. There are also ways of defending individual structures or bases or that sort of thing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about defensive structures. Now, the most important thing when choosing where your base of operations is going to be uh, or where you're going to hold territory is to make sure that you are able to either seize or create elevated ground. You always want to make sure that you have the high ground. It's not just uh, some sort of old thing that people say, hey, make sure you take the high ground. It's actually a military strategy that enables you to have a superior advantage. Even if that high ground is a foot or two above the street level, then you're inevitably going to create a much more tactically significant uh, elevated position than the opposing force has. And if you're able to uh, bolster that position, or if you're able to fortify it through things like fences or barricades or barriers, then you're going to do even better. High ground can be obtained in several different ways. Obviously, you could set up your base on the top of a hill or on the top of a slope, but you can also create high ground on your own. Ancient Romans would do this every single day. Typically, a Roman legion, even if they had to stay the night anywhere, would create an entire encampment basically out of nowhere. And in that encampment, they'd have a lot of different defensive structures. First of all, they would create uh, several different walls, usually created out of wooden javelin-looking structures uh, that would line the entire perimeter of that base. Uh, but it would be at the top of a small hill that they created by making a bit of an earthwork. 
They would dig a ditch around their entire perimeter, and they would use the earth from that ditch to pile up next to it, uh, so they would have a bit of a rampart or a bit of a hill that gave them the defensive ability to basically set up that fence and have an elevated position over any enemy that tried to attack their base. Obviously, in a lot of different situations, using an earthwork or digging a moat or a ditch or something like that isn't necessarily feasible, uh, but there are a lot of different ways that you can elevate your position up off that solid ground so you can actually gain uh, some sort of tactical advantage. You could build some sort of rampart, which is basically an elevated defensive sidewalk of sorts. It could just be a pile of dirt, or maybe you want to build some sort of actual structure out of wood. Whatever it is, usually that will work to give you an elevated position and an area where you can actually defend properly against an opposing force. You always want to have the high ground. And like I was saying before, if you're able to get that high ground, the first thing that you want to do is create some sort of walls or barriers. Usually these walls, preferably, could be several layers thick, such as three fences as opposed to just one. And in between those fences, you want to have a large open area. Sometimes those open areas can have ditches dug into them as sort of makeshift moats. Of course, that's not necessarily possible in every situation, uh, but you also want to have that large space in between those two lines of fences uh, because in that area, you basically create something known as a kill zone. It forces the opposition to go through the first barrier and then be stuck in between two other barriers where they basically have nowhere to go. You can also have other things such as choke points that stops any large phalanx from being able to uh, go through that barrier without breaking up into smaller groups or even individuals so they can actually pass through. And you can do this by bottlenecking areas or you could also set up chevron shaped barricades that naturally work like those cunium formates, those wedge uh, positions to all by themselves break up the formation of any sort of structured line and make all of those people have to walk through individually. And of course, all throughout history, there have been lots of obstacles and barricades that have been used uh, to make sure that the entrance and egress of any one of these uh, tactical positions is extremely difficult. Uh, obviously, in, um, say, World War One, you had wire obstacles, which were often created out of, uh, say, barbed wire. You'd have boxes that were made with barbed wire all around them that were easy to move and place into positions, uh, but you could also have those uh, big coils of wire that you could just lay out in front of an area or across the top of a fence, whatever it was. Uh, those are usually excellent um, deterrence, especially for individual troops. The individual soldier usually has a very hard time getting through barbed wire obstacles. But different types of obstacles work very well in different types of situations. A barbed wire obstacle isn't going to work very well against an armored car or a tank, but something as simple as a few road stars would completely incapacitate any rubber tired vehicle. So there are lots of booby traps and stuff like that uh, that have been implemented throughout history to stop the opposing force from actually being able to get inside of a fortified structure. But no matter how strong your structure is, uh, your structure is only as strong as the gates that you use to get in and out of it, uh, because usually gates are a weak point in any kind of wall. If you have a big solid iron or stone wall and a wooden gate, it's going to be easy to break through. So you have to find a lot of different ways to defend your gates as well. Obviously, you can have things like solid doors or maybe a drawbridge that falls over top of a moat or whatever it is. Uh, but also, in, say, medieval times, they would have something known as a gatehouse. Now, a gatehouse is basically a defensive structure that's built around a gate that allows for uh, tactical defense on top of that gate, on the sides of that gate, and usually behind that gate. It's small details like that that really make the difference when it comes to defensive structures. If you're able to take apart the way that a military formation actually works into its basic smallest pieces, that's where you're actually able to start picking and prodding and pointing out all of the little problems with it and using those problems to your advantage. 
but a defensive structure is always going to be weak against any sort of siege. And a siege is basically uh, when a military force attacks some sort of defensive base or castle or fortified location, whatever it is. Sieges also very much involved burning down buildings or setting fire to areas, filling them with smoke, choking out locations, so it just forced the people out of their defensive bases as well. Uh, and that's used very often in modern settings uh, when, say, an attack force is using something like a smoke grenade or flashbangs uh, or things like that. It basically makes it impossible for the people that are inside of that defensive structure uh, to be able to exist inside that defensive structure without choking and dying or being completely miserable. Which is a really good reason why any entrance or egress or windows or anything like that are all boarded up shut tight uh, so no smoke grenades or fires or anything like that can actually get inside of the defensive structure. And like I was saying a moment ago, another perfect way to defeat a defensive structure is through attrition through basically starving them out. If you create that little perimeter wall, nobody's able to leave. You can also just stop any ability from them to get supplies, right? If there are wagon trains going into that castle fortification, you just stop those wagon trains and eventually the people inside will starve or die of thirst and you win. So yeah, that's basically all of the different forms of defense uh, that I could think of for this video. There are a lot of different other things that we could talk about as well, but maybe we'll save that for another time. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, that's my show. My name is Aaron. If you like my content, please hit the little like button and show the YouTube algorithm uh, that my content is worth the shit. And uh, also, please uh, make sure that you're still subscribed because there are unsubscribing people every single day. Uh, so make sure you do that. And thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day.